when you go into space and look back, we're one world with amazingly diverse geology that crosses national boundaries. And when you look out, we're just a small speck. We're one people sharing one sky. Welcome to Books and Ideas. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is the podcast where I explore topics ranging from science to science fiction and everything in between. I started Books and Ideas back in 2006, at the same time I launched my more popular show, Brain Science, and I'm really happy to have Books and Ideas back on a monthly schedule. To get complete show notes and more episodes of Books and Ideas, please visit booksandideas.com. You can send me feedback at docartemis at gmail.com or submit voicemail at speakpipe.com forward slash docartemis. My guest today is astronomer and podcasting pioneer, Dr. Pamela Gay. Dr. Gay and I first met back in 2007, and she was an early guest on Books and Ideas, so I'm thrilled to have her back. Her show, Astronomy Cast, has been airing weekly since 2005 with over 500 episodes. Between my three podcasts, I've hosted less than 300 episodes. She's really prolific. She's also a working astronomer who is committed to public outreach efforts. So we have plenty to talk about. Please stay tuned after the interview for a few brief announcements. Have you ever considered hiring a personal coach? The key tool of coaching is asking empowering questions to help clients live more fulfilling lives. I'm currently training to become a certified professional coach, and I will begin to accept a limited number of clients in November 2019. Meanwhile, I'm also doing some free introductory discovery sessions. If you think you might benefit from this approach, you can email me at docartemis at gmail.com. So, Pam, it is fantastic to finally get to talk to you again. Oh, it's been a long time. And what's been amazing is we've kept running into each other at conferences across all these years. And uh, at a certain point in our adult life, it just seems like three years ago was three days ago. (laughs) It's actually been now, I think, 12 years since we met. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> As I said, a certain point in our adult life. <laughs> so, Pam, before we get started, I want to congratulate you for being one of the inductees into the 2018 Academy of Podcasters Hall of Fame. It's an honor that you really deserve. And so I just want to congratulate you again. Oh, thank you so much. It it was awesome to get to see you there. I know that there are people who've been there since the beginning there that night. And I think you were the first science podcaster. Yes. And uh, I'm hoping for the chance to get to nominate other scientists for the work that they're doing in this crazy online medium that we've all been developing. So... Since it has been so long since we originally talked, I think you were on an episode of Books and Ideas in 2007. Why don't you just start out by telling my audience a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and then tell us about your podcast. (laughs) So my name is Dr. Pamela Gay. I'm a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute, which it's headquartered out of Tucson, Arizona. But the hundred some odd researchers that work for the Planetary Science Institute are actually scattered all over the world, which helps cut down the price of science and uh, eliminate the two-body problem where people are married and you have to try and find jobs for both people in one place. It's a really progressive organization, and I'm really proud to be part of it. As part of the work that I do there, I am director of the CosmoQuest Virtual Research Institute, which is a facility that helps anyone who has time to do science 
find ways to volunteer to help us explore this universe that we share. And we look for complicated data problems that scientists have that we can't yet solve just by typing up the right algorithm. Right. And there are problems that computers can't just crunch the numbers. And computer vision just isn't there. One of the problems that we're working on right now is there's this little spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx that is orbiting a near-Earth object. This is an asteroid that's orbit crosses back and forth across the Earth's orbit. And this is a giant rubble pile out in space. And we want to grab a piece of it to bring back to Earth, just go down and do a touch-and-go theft of soil to find some place that's safe enough for our spacecraft to go in, we need to measure the locations of pretty much all the rocks that are 12 inches across, all the boulders, however many meters across they might be. And this is hard work, and people keep saying, well, why don't you just use machine learning? Well, the thing is, it might take us a million images to train a machine learning algorithm to be almost good enough compared to a human, but they'll never be good as a human at this stage in writing the software. And we only have 4,500 images to do, so I have fewer images than I would need to train that algorithm. So we have to do all of these by hand. We really don't have a choice. Okay, that makes sense. So how does this relate to your original training in in astronomy? Because I remember we talked about that years ago. So my my master's work was studying variable stars in the Ursa Minor Dwarf Soroidal Galaxy. And that took me from my field stars looking at pulsating variables in our galaxy that I did as an undergrad out to galactic astronomy. And from there, I jumped to studying the evolution of galaxies and clusters to do my PhD. And that led me to getting involved with the Galaxy Zoo project and helping to write software and design websites that eventually became the Zooniverse and allowed everyday people all over the world to contribute to doing science. Back in 2012, I collaborated with a bunch of folks with a variety of different NASA spacecraft to build CosmoQuest, which would go that next step further and go from just engaging people in doing the science, to also taking the time to mentor them, to educate them using new media. So I finally brought in the podcasting that I've been doing since 2005. And with CosmoQuest, we bring it all together in one place, the podcasting, the educational content, the science, the software. And it all works together to, well, in this case, we're going to find that place that Osiris Rex is going to grab a rock. Once we can get this rock from the... Okay. A Cybers Rex is the... Spacecraft. The spacecraft. Does the near-Earth object have a name? Yeah, it's called Bennu. B-E-N-N-U. And it's literally a rubble pile. It looks like some interplanetary dump truck had been slewing along through the solar system, hit who knows what, and just dumped its load out into space. It's, it looks like nothing more than thousands to millions of rocks and boulders that are just barely gravitationally held on to one another. It's not like the Earth's moon. It's not like any of the asteroids we've looked at before. It's, it's this horrifying rubble pile in space that really doesn't offer any safe place that is clearly what we are hoping for on its surface to go grab that soil sample. So when we grab the soil sample, we won't the spaceship won't land. They'll just try to It's a touch and go. The way to think of it is if you've ever been uh, vacuuming up spider webs and you just shove your vacuum into the corner of the ceiling and pull it out again and you've grabbed all those spider webs. Well, this spacecraft has something that's not truly a vacuum cleaner, but it's a hose that has little bristly bits at the end that, or in this case, little treddy bits at the end that will help suck up material into what I describe as an angry vacuum cleaner. So it's going to go in with its nozzle, grab the sample that's going to be pebbles and dirt and who knows what, and stick all of that in a container that it's then later going to throw at the planet Earth, and it will pass through our atmosphere in the capsule that's been designed to go through our atmosphere. 
and it's going to be put into a very special containment vessel here on Earth so that there's no chance of any of the dust, grains of particles, molecules getting contaminated by us or us getting contaminated by it. We're going to use this to study what is the composition of this really weird object so close to our own planet in the solar system. Okay. So beyond learning what the composition of this garbage pile is, what kind of fundamental questions will that give us clues about? We still don't really know where solar systems come from. We have these big picture ideas of it all starts with a giant cloud of dust and gas and something sends that cloud collapsing and fragmenting. And one of those fragments collapses down and spins up and planets in a star pop out the other side of this process. But all these intermediate stages, we don't fully understand. We keep finding solar systems that defy all of our prior expectations. And once a solar system forms, we don't know how much it changes over the millions and billions of years that these solar systems exist. We think in our own solar system that Saturn and Jupiter are responsible for flinging Uranus and Neptune out into the outer parts of the solar system. And during that amazing age of flinging worlds around, they also threw things inwards, causing an error of great heavy bombardment. And these asteroids are the leftover pieces, things that didn't actually get flung into a planet. And by studying them, we get to study, well, what were the original pieces, the original ingredients of our solar system? It's like finding a splot of unbaked pie dough that didn't quite make it into the oven. Oh. <laughs> the, the chemistry is going to be slightly different. It's not going to have any of the processes that happen from weathering, that happen from all the atmospheric effects, all of the tectonic effects, the recycling that happens on our planet. This is just pure, not entirely mixed up ingredients that we get to study. So how, how many years do you think it's going to take to finish this project? Our mapping project, we're currently in overtime. Each of these images is taking literally 10 times longer to map than anticipated because we're expecting a world that would have maybe a few boulders per every wrestling ring area of space might have tens of rocks. Now, what it actually has is dozens and dozens of boulders and hundreds and hundreds of rocks. And so it's going to be done when it's done. And hopefully that will be in the next few weeks because we really need to identify the safe places to take our spacecraft in. We're hoping to get the sample in December. We want to do a trial run with the spacecraft before that. And we're already in the process of doing uh, higher resolution imaging of potential sites that have already been discovered in the areas we've mapped. So is it OSIRIS-REx that's going to try to grab this dust, or is it a different... It's OSIRIS-REx. Our spacecraft is already there. It's in orbit. Okay. And how much does that cost? I mean, I assume it's a pretty expensive vacuum cleaner. This is actually one of the smaller spacecraft that is out there. So we measure its cost in millions of dollars, not in billions of dollars. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I don't know its exact budget, but... It's the kind of thing that, well, one really rich person could afford to do. And in our case, NASA is affording to let the folks running it out of the University of Arizona do it. Well, that's exciting. And it's come a long way from when we talked back in November when it wasn't clear what you were going to be doing. Yes, it's been a wild year around here. I, I, like so many others, have had to deal with the changing mission of NASA, the changing way that funding has to get spent. One of those things that folks don't often think about is when we hear on the radio about the James Webb Space Telescope running years and years over time and running billions of dollars over budget, all of that money has to come from somewhere. So if they expected that the mission was going to launch in August and all of its construction fees would be done being spent because it's constructed, it's in space, 
And then they turn around and say, no, it's not done. No, we need to do all of these rebuilds. Well, the money that had already been allocated to do things because we thought the spacecraft was going to launch, that money has to come from somewhere. And I don't know if it's exactly me that it came from, but uh, I'd been warned that my program might lose its funding due to James Webb Space Telescope cost overruns. And then one Thursday night at 9.30 in the evening, I got that notice that my budget was zeroed for my primary infrastructure grant. Uh, I still had a contract with OSIRIS-REx. Uh, it was a separate contract that was basically to build on the work that we were doing to have our primary infrastructure. So we've been keeping our website going, keeping our infrastructure going, thanks to the amazing donations of people all over the world who recognize that sometimes it's not our governments that can fund science because, well, they have limited resources. And sometimes you have to be the change you want to see in the world. So if you want to see more science done, well, there are people out there that respond by saying, let me open my wallet and I will fund that science getting done. Yeah, we kind of forget because we came of age in a time where science was mainly funded by government that that hasn't always been the case, and it's probably an historical anomaly. It's true. Historically, you've often heard of Kepler was an astronomer royale, uh, Herschel was an astronomer royale, it was kings. Galileo was funded by a pope before he annoyed another pope and got himself in a world of hurt. Astronomers have been funded by the wealthy and the dreaming. And we have been there to tell the stories that are, I guess, the opposite of what a jester tells. Instead of bringing attention to the world that we live in as a form of escape with sarcasm, well, we bring attention to the world beyond the one that we live on. And we inspire people to think bigger, think further. Now, I'm not funded by any kings or queens or popes, although I would take their money. <laughs> but uh, it's been small companies. It's been my podcast is sponsored by BarkBox. So I am happy to have funding that helps me communicate science and brings joy to dog owners. <laughs> it's been a whole lot of everyday people who've kept us going. Great. And I'll be sure that I get a bunch of links from you that I can put in my show notes so people can get involved. So let's talk a little bit about podcasting. When did you start podcasting? February 14th, 2005. So early, early. We were the very first science and technology podcast. It was uh, the Slacker Astronomy podcast that I started on. And Adam Curry had to create a whole new category for us in the old school podcast directory. This was back in the days before iTunes was a thing. It was before iPods were a thing. We were all using iRivers at that point in time. And I still have my original iRiver, actually. Yeah, I remember. I mean, I didn't know podcasting until it showed up in iTunes, but I remember reading about iRivers, having never owned one. I had an iPod. But I remember that they were the thing that the podcasters listened on. And they were awesome because they were basically the size of a lipstick case and you could stick several CDs, hours and hours of podcasts on them. And they just took a single AA battery and you were good. It made the old Walkman look so junky. <laughs> we felt so advanced with our technology. And now, of course... Well, they have the iPod minis that make even the iRivers look huge. It's, it's amazing how technology has evolved over the years. And, and with it, we've seen podcasting change where originally most of us were just talking into our microphone. You could hear background music. There were folks that did their podcasts while they were doing their dishes and you could hear the clanks and the voices in the background and dogs barking. And now, I listen to NPR, and every NPR show is like, and you can listen to our podcast. Everything is audio quality of NPR, all the podcasts, it seems like. So we, we've lost that, well, garage band 
mentality, and here I don't mean the software garage band, although I did use that once upon a time. Here I mean there's that way a band sounds when they're still practicing in their dad's garage. And then there's the way they sound when they get their big fancy pants studio. We've evolved to, well, most of us have built our fancy pants studios in our walk-in closets. But some of the shows that we loved in the beginning, or like yours, are still around. It's been an amazing journey. So what particular, I mean, you know, we're in this niche of science podcasting, which is a relatively small niche. And like our friend Manon Fogarty gave up on science podcasting early on. So what about the challenges of doing science podcasting? Well, I think the challenge of doing science podcasting is the same as the challenge of doing science writing, of doing science journalism, of doing science. And it's that when you tell someone, in my case, I'm an astrophysicist, in your case, I'm a doctor, they're sort of like, oh, you're smart, that's scary. And sometimes they respond by looking at their shoes. And sometimes if they're really outgoing, they respond by looking at your shoes. <laughs> we scare people and we have to find ways to change the mentality of the public, to take it from being one of science is this thing that we see the nerds are made fun of on most television shows. There's entire television shows dedicated to making fun of nerds. The Big Bang Theory is, is basically one long stereotype that has been made pleasurable, but really it's kind of making fun of nerds. In order to get listened to, we have to go from, hey, we're talking about this big, scary science thing, to making people feel that they're welcome and they can understand and that we're not going to talk down to them, but we're going to assume if they're out there listening, they are smart enough to have the ability to learn if we only take the time to explain you can explain what you do in medicine to me, and I'm not educated to understand that stuff. I can explain to you what I do in astronomy. We're in totally different fields, and we can learn each other's field because we take the time to break it down. We just have to convince audiences to trust us, that we will give them a safe place to learn. That's always going to be hard. There's always going to be more fiction writers than science writers. There's always going to be more people passionate about the science fiction podcasts than about the science podcasts. And the science fiction are even a small category, but they're bigger than us. It's just hard. Nerds are having a revolution. It is our heyday, but we still have a long way to go. Yeah, but I think that you touched on something really important, that not talking down thing. I mean, that's what I've learned from brain science is people, they don't want to be talked down to. They don't even have to understand every little thing as long as you don't talk down to them. And once we recognize that we all have something to learn from each other, it makes it easier. And I've learned so much from members of my audience who've seen me struggling with this thing or that thing in terms of my website, our logos, and... They've just reached out and said, hey, let me show you. And so it's, it's become not just me pushing content out to the audience, but the audience reaching back and saying, here, let us help. I don't think I've been as successful at doing that as you have, but I think there's something about putting a show out every week. How many, You've put out like 500 and something episodes. 540-ish, I think, 550 yeah, and it's going to take me at least another year or two to make it to 300. So, <laughs> And what always amazes me is there's people out there that aren't just doing weekly, they're doing daily. And some of these content creators, especially those over on YouTube, where they have to worry about lighting. Audio is hard. Lighting is way harder. To see them, we can find our own inspiration. And this is one of the really cool things about the science communications community is we help lift one another up. And so I take my inspiration of, oh, what I have is nothing. I look at what the YouTube folks are doing day after day. 
And we just have to keep finding our own role models to push us forward. I really enjoy bringing you books and ideas every month. Even though brain science is more popular, I love having the freedom to cover a wide variety of topics. But since Books and Ideas is too small to attract advertising, I've set up a Patreon account to help defer the cost of producing the show, such as hosting and audio editing. If you're already supporting brain science via Patreon, there's no need to make a separate donation. But if you'd like the freedom of choosing your monthly amount without the tiers that go with the brain science account, just go to patreon.com forward slash books and ideas. Speaking of role models, what about being a woman in science? That was something we talked about way back then when we first talk. And the reason I bring it up is because I remember that when I did your original interview, I got a lot of feedback actually from guys who wanted to know more about this issue of being a woman in science, because I guess it was something they just never thought about. So yeah. how's that situation? I don't recommend it. Yeah, I, you don't have an option on this one. I recommend being a scientist, but the whole woman in science, I'd rather just be a scientist. But the problem is you and I will always be women scientists instead of just scientists. We will always be women podcasters instead of podcasters. There is this weight of microaggressions, macroaggressions, and just plain, I don't know if I can swear, but I'm going to say ass hattery <laughs> involved that we have to deal with that men don't generally have to deal with. In podcasting, the, the way that it first raised its ugly head to me was... Fraser and I, Fraser's my co-host on Astronomy Cast, and he's publisher of Universe Today, Fraser Kane. We started getting, and we got a bunch of these emails, one after another, every few months, and they all started out, Dear Mr. Kane or Dear Fraser. And they'd be sent to both of us, but they'd only be addressed to Fraser. And the first paragraph would start with, I am not a PhD astronomer, but, and they'd list off some sort of a qualification like a PhD in physics, a master's degree in engineering, and they inevitably would have been in the workforce since before I was born. Always a man. The next paragraph would be, we demand an apology on air because your co-host, Pamela, not Dr. Gay, is glib, is doing a, a disservice to science, is they'd always find something in terms of by popularizing astronomy, I was doing it in a way that was not respectful to the field because I was not making it dry and boring. That isn't <laughs> what they said, but that's what they meant. Well, you're in, you're in good company there with Carl Sagan, you know. He... <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but the third paragraph was the real killer. It was always, and if you need a new co-host, I am available. Nice male co-host. Oh, so the first time we got one of these, I was sitting at my desk. I was a baby assistant professor, and I was absolutely devastated. And I'm trying to figure out how to write back, how to apologize for being too glib. And while I'm sitting there being devastated, and this is back in the days when we were all paying for our bandwidth. We still pay for our bandwidth, but it's not the same concern it was then. I see Fraser's response pop up in my email, and it was along the lines of, Dear so-and-so, thank you for your feedback. Please understand we provide this show to you for free. If you do not like our show, please stop consuming our bandwidth. May I recommend? And then he listed off three or four different podcasts. And that idea that you could just say, go away, that's something that made me so glad to have Fraser in my life because once we'd gotten like a dozen of these letters, I saw the pattern and I realized, ah, here's the real problem. I'm young and I'm female. Only one of those do you get to outgrow. It was hard. And then as you grow in popularity, you start getting the random someone in your comments is talking about sexual acts they do to your voice or the times that you get doxxed where someone publishes all of your 
address and phone number information just to try and make you feel threatened. And these things just make it hard. But you can brush them all off. The thing that makes it really hard is all the times you go to a conference to be a scientist, to talk to people about science, and you find yourself trying to find a wall to lean up against so no one will slap your butt as they walk by and crossing your arms so no one grabs a boob. These are all things that have happened to me over and over and over again. And I eventually reached the point where I was senior enough in my career that I thought as an officer in professional societies, I'd finally have the power and the voice to make things that got reported actually have something happen to the person who was doing the harassing. So back in 2015, I had multiple groups of people come to me and report a single individual. Two totally different sets of people that had different clumps within these two different groups during the reporting. And I was an officer of multiple professional societies, so I moved forward with the complaint. And the result of that was both societies said, we don't have any guidelines for dealing with harassers. These actions did not take place during an officially sanctioned meeting, by which they meant in the room that a official event was in that moment happening. So during lunch, during dinner, at a conference didn't count. The guy who I was trying to act on the complaints sued me for $33 million. And I just finished spending three and a half years of my life dealing with that legal case. And it is devastating. I switched jobs twice to escape retaliation at two different organizations. And the retaliation was because of this lawsuit, because I reported harassment. I dealt with the financial blowback. I had insurance that covered most of my legal bills, but it didn't cover all the grants I didn't have the energy to write, all of the retaliation that led to opportunities being lost. I don't think I'll ever have the career I would have had if that lawsuit had never happened. It's a step function. I lost an entire step. And this is why women don't report. And this is why it's crazy when somebody says, oh, she just made that up. It just makes no sense, given what happens to a woman when they report. And what really gets me is when another woman will say, well, why did she wait so long? I don't believe her because she waited so long. Duh. When the person does report, they usually do it because they feel like they've got an obligation to other people and they're, they've decided that they are going to pay the price. Mm -hmm. And that's always what it is. The first time that I came forward about someone who had harassed me, it was because I found out that he'd gone on to rape people. And I always wondered if I had said something back in 2000, I think it was 2007, if I, no, it was 2008. It was 2007 or 2008. I have it in my notes. I don't have it in my brain. But I remember exactly where it happened. I remember exactly when it happened. I know where I was walking from, where I was walking to, and who I was with. And there were witnesses. I didn't report it because he was drunk. I had been drinking. It just didn't seem worth it. And then to find out that my silence and the silence of all these other women who were just like, it's just not worth it, gave this man essentially carte blanche to know that he could get away with it. Enough is enough. But you can't do that if you're junior in your career because you won't have a career. You can't do it if you don't have a safety net. I was lucky. My, my husband earns enough income that when my income tanks we can still pay the bills. Lots of people can't do that. Right. And women don't earn as much as men, especially in academia. And we don't get advanced the same way men do. In astronomy, it goes from roughly 50-50 at the lowest undergraduate levels to about 11% at the senior levels. We just leave. It's just, I almost left. I was done. I was just done. But my audience lifted me up and said, no, we want you to stay. I am so lucky. Most people aren't as lucky as I am. 
So the bottom line is that things really haven't gotten any better. No. There are a few very loud cases of individuals who have been driven out of prominent positions in the field. Jeff Marcy in astronomy is one example. But there are other examples, like Chris Ott from Caltech, who've gone on to get other jobs still tangentially in the field. And the particular person that I reported is still a named endowed professor, still has tenure, wasn't affected. There are new legislative actions going through, new policies, the National Science Foundation in particular, that are requiring institutions to report if someone has been found guilty through a Title IX complaint of workplace harassment of students or peers. It's a new system. It's still not really tested. I don't know what the eventual answer is, but one piece of advice that I got a long time ago is keep your women colleagues close. And I think that is really the key, is we have to lift each other up. And it's too easy for senior women to become gatekeepers, to say, I fought, I got here, you're not tough enough. The very first woman astronomer I ever met did that to me. It was my first week as an undergraduate. I was assigned a mentor. I wrote to her quite happy and chipper. I'd been doing research astronomy for four years already as a high school student. And I was like, I'm a dual degree, international relations, astrophysics, because that's what I was. And she wrote back, if you're interested in that international relations stuff, drop astrophysics. You're not serious enough or tough enough. And I grumped the way only a teenager can, because I was still a teenager my first year of university. And luckily, I ended up finding a much better advisor who was a male ally. And he helped me through. But since then, over and over, I've had to find the women colleagues who would listen, who would support, who would mentor. And now I'm trying to be that person to the next generation. We have to take care of each other. All right. So, what do you like to do when you're not doing astronomy? <laughs> so, uh, or podcasting. Right. right. So, I, I paint, although that's slowly becoming a side hustle. So, it's less of a hobby and more of a side hustle. I paint planets because I can. I learned a, a technique of fluid painting from the artist Amy Davis Roth, who has the Surly Amy store for ceramics. And she's doing this new technique called fluid painting, and she's been doing amazing seascapes and skies and just really cool artwork. And she's even been doing a lot of neurology stuff where she's figured out how to get the consistency of the paint just right to make it look like she's painted a bunch of neurons. And it's all chemical reactions going on in the paint that does this. I'm going to have to contact her because since I quit going to Dragon Con, I haven't, and the amazing meeting, I haven't seen her. I mean, I have some of her older work, but I don't have any of this new stuff. Yeah, she's doing amazing things. And I got to visit her and visit her studio. And she taught me this technique. And I realized that the physics that was working in the fluids of the paint is very similar to the physics that drives atmospheres, just at very different scales. And so I've been trying to figure out how to paint more realistic gas giants to bring out different effects. It's really applying all of this science in a very, very nerdy way to doing acrylic painting. Um, and I sell it all on Etsy because side hustle. I'm a scientist. We don't earn a lot of money. But I also I have three dogs. One of them is a foster dog for Central Aussie Rescue and Support. And I've been really enjoying fostering dogs for them. I used to ride horses, but I don't have the money for a horse right now. So I'm just fostering stray dogs, literally fostering stray dogs right now. So I usually ask for advice for students, and I think there's been a little embedded into the conversation. <laughs> but if you'd like to address that question directly. The best advice that I can give to any student is when you're picking a research advisor, don't pick based strictly on who's doing the best science, who's doing the stuff that you're most interested in. Find the human being that you most get along with, because you're going to be spending a whole lot of time with that person. Work with that person who you like as a human being to learn how to do science. And 
it will serve you well because that person is going to be tied to you for the rest of your life. We don't think about it, but we're actually developing an academic pedigree. And that will carry on where if you go on to become that professor, that research scientist, people will be introducing you as received their bachelor's at, went on to get a PhD with naming that advisor for the rest of your life. And you want to be somebody you want attached to. Yeah. I can think, think of a few people I wouldn't want my name attached to. <laughs> exactly. And and it's not just the reputation. It's also the, oh, wow, they're an asshole. You had to work with them. Don't do that to yourself, people. Find someone that you will enjoy being with, and you'll end up actually liking the science a whole lot better. Working with a bad person will make you hate the science. Sounds like a lesson learned the hard way. Um, Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so... What are your dreams for the future? Oh, man. Right now, it's to get enough grant funding that I can focus on doing science instead of focusing on raising money. I hate fundraising, but I have a staff of fabulous human beings that I really want to keep going. And so far, we're managing, but I'm going to be writing a whole lot of grants in the future. And my goal is to fund my staff to keep everything going so that me and a couple of colleagues can focus on doing the research to understand what is it that motivates people to do citizen science? How can we better develop systems for doing machine learning algorithms that will allow us to effectively train, well, these almost black box algorithms to well, map other worlds for us so there's less human suffering in doing the mapping by hand. And when I say human suffering, I mean it because like some of my volunteers are developing calluses from clicking too much on rocks. I want to do a lot more machine learning research and a lot more working with psychologists on human subject research to understand what motivates some people to do science as a hobby while others are off enjoying Gardening is a perfectly reasonable thing that I do as well, but some people have more joy in gardening than I will ever have in gardening. Mm -hmm. And so you want to figure out how to make the citizen science reach the right people and then figure out what things the person really needs to do and what things could be offloaded to the deep learning tools. It's through this hybrid approach. It's really a four-step process. You need to have the software that helps you get and gather all of the data, whether it's from spacecraft or robotic telescopes. You bring that data in, and then you need to have this entire system that inspires people to get engaged and trains them on how to accomplish these complicated tasks or not complicated tasks as successfully as the PhD scientists do. Then we need to figure out just how much do we have to ask humans to do before we can hand it off to the computer? Because the less we have to ask humans to do, the more different things we can study. The machine learning algorithms that solve for craters on the moon are differently trained than the ones for Mercury because the surface physics, the physics itself works the same, but how it looks when you have a crater in a really hard surface versus a lighter surface... Mercury and the moon do not look the same. And so we have to do separate machine learning solutions. Well, if we can get it so that we only need tens of thousands of images marked before the software is off and running on its own, well, that means that we can leapfrog from the moon to Mars to Mercury to asteroid after asteroid after asteroid and just increase our surface science research. Well, it doesn't sound like you're ever going to run out of work. No, it's the funding that's the problem, not the work. <laughs> so we have lots of amazing things that we want to do. And I'm going to be spending most of August and September and October writing grants. But for now, I told myself July would be when I sit down and only work on software. And then I'll be slowly fading over to doing grants as well. And you gave yourself a hiatus on Astronomy Cast to breathe? Yes. Yes. We do take the summer off pretty much every summer. And this is when we go through and do website updates, formatting updates, change things. Last year, we introduced a new theme song and just plan the next year. We're thinking next summer, we're probably going to do a trip somewhere. 
I am personally wanting to go to Yellowstone, but we're still figuring these details out. So our summer is our planning and building time. And it's just easier if we don't have the deadlines of getting a new show out every week to add on to that. Well, I tried to put my show out, my new show out every week. That lasted for three months. (laughs) Well, (laughs) this is where I'm lucky because we have peoples. It's not just Fraser and I. We're the only voices that you usually hear on the show. But we have Susie Murph, who does both our audio engineering and she maintains our website. I've always seen Susie Murph posted for Astronomy Cast. I get like a notice a day on her, on my phone. (laughs) Yes. So she's been doing all of our social media. She's been doing all of our audio and website work. And then we have the Weekly Space Hangout crew, which is a swarm, I think, is probably the best adjective. It's a swarm of volunteers who are there to basically cheerlead us on and fill in wherever we need. We have one volunteer that every time I get baffled by something with our Amazon Web Services account, I'm like, have you ever encountered this? Do you know how to fix this? And he has helped me with multiple weird one-off server failures. And having these people is what allows us to do what we do. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we close? I guess the one thing I'd love if everyone would just recognizes our world, it seems fragmented more than ever right now with so much nationalism, so much hate. But when you go into space and look back, we're one world with amazingly diverse geology that crosses national boundaries. And when you look out, we're just a small speck. We're one people sharing one sky is what they say with astronomers without borders. And when I go to bed tonight, I'm going to see the stars out my window and know that a few hours later, my closest friends in California will be seeing the same thing. And we just pass the stars from one to another as the world rotates. So go outside and look up and know that just like that little mouse sang in that 1980s movie, we all have the same stars. Thank you, Pam. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to Dr. Pamela Gay again. Be sure to check out her podcast, Astronomy Cast, and I will have links to the projects she mentioned in my show notes at booksandideas.com. I would love to hear what you think about this episode. You can send me email at docartemis at gmail.com or submit voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis. And you can also post your comments on the Books on Dia's Facebook fan page. I'm also Doc Artemis on Twitter. You'll find all the episodes of Books and Ideas at booksandideas.com, but I hope you'll also subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Don't forget that if you'd like an Amazon gift card, all you have to do is post a review in iTunes and send me a screenshot at docartemis at gmail.com. I'll be back again with a new episode of Books and Ideas next month on the 15th. Until then, I hope you'll listen to my other podcasts, Graying Rainbows and Brain Science. Books and Ideas is copyright 2019 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You can copy this show to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at docartemis at gmail.com. Theme music for Books and Ideas is The Open Door by Beatnik Turtle. Please visit their website at beatnikturtle.com. 